All right. All right, can everyone hear me? All right, so that was actually a really nice kind of setup for the work that I'm going to be talking about. So I'm do, I did something very, very similar to what Elad did. But uh, so I'm actually, I'm a grad student at UC Irvine, and I work primarily with Michael Cooper, but also with James Bullock and some of these other people down here on the left. And I'm going to be transitioning slightly to low mass satellite uh, galaxy quenching, specifically via stripping. But when I say low mass, I mean very low mass, like 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 in stellar masses. So these are objects that are dwarf galaxies that we can really only observe in any sort of uh, complete sense in the local universe. And so to introduce this idea and I guess kind of transition to quenching in a low mass universe, I'm going to show you this figure that I've show I showed previously, uh, I guess last year. And this is a nice figure that shows the satellite quenching efficiency as a function of stellar mass. And when we look at the high mass objects, or in my world, the high mass objects are above 10 to the 8 in stellar mass, we see relatively low, quen uh, yeah, low quenching efficiencies. And when we compare these low quenching efficiencies to end body simulations, we infer relatively long quenching time scales. And these are consistent with kind of a slow mode style quenching that you get something like starvation. This is in stark contrast to what we see when we move down underneath uh, 10 to the 8 in stellar mass, roughly 10 to the 6 to 10 to the, 10 to the 8 in stellar mass, and these are only local group points. But we see this really dramatic increase in the quenching efficiency. And then when we play a similar game and compare these high quenching efficiencies to n-body simulations, we infer really, really short quenching time scales. And so this is consistent with you know, something like ram pressure stripping, a more kind of a fast mode uh, quenching scenario. And so when we look at this kind of broader stellar mass range, we see this really abrupt change in the quenching efficiency as we move to lower satellite, uh, lower satellite stellar masses, specifically in the local group. And so my work was to, uh, generally to try to understand this. And we were true, trying to answer two kind of primary questions. And that is, can gas stripping reproduce what we're calling this critical mass in satellite quenching? And so if we come back here and we look right around 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 in stellar mass, you see this kind of uptick where the satellite quenching efficiency changes dramatically. And we think that indicates a change in the dominant mechanism that is actually acting on these satellites. And secondly, is gas stripping effective enough on average? So what, what I mean by that is that we need to remove virtually all of the H1 from these things. because so We need to shut down star formation really, really quickly and these really, really high quenching efficiencies that we observe in these low mass objects basically force us to shut these things down extremely quickly. And so to this end, I built a very, in a similar fashion, but I think a lot is slightly more sophisticated, but a, an analytic gas stripping pipeline. And so what I've shown here is, and I don't have time to go through the details, but please come talk to me at coffee if you're interested in those, but generally, we implement kind of a, a gun and got style ram pressure on the left, and then a kind of a gravitational restoring pressure on the right. And where our analysis, I think, is slightly different than many others is for our ISM that we're looking to remove, we actually look to the local universe. And so these are actual observations of 66 H1 surface density profiles that we pull, pull from the literature, specifically the things, little things, and shield survey. And for every single one of these H1 surface density profiles, we assign them uh, basically a restoring mass via abundance matching. So you can see that up here. And then for the ram pressure side of the equation, we assume a variety of values for the hot halo density that we take from the literature. And for the infalling satellite population velocities, we choose a few values that we think correspond to important times during the subhalos um, orbits. And we, and we get those from simulations, specifically the Elvis simulation. And so when we turn the crank, so to speak, uh, this is one of the main results. And so what I have here is the strip fraction or the fraction of the H1 that's removed from any one of these satellites, the function of stellar mass. And a few things kind of jump out or jumped out at me immediately when I saw this. And first was at the high mass end, all of the high mass objects are Pretty, I mean, they're pretty robust to strip. They're, they're not affected by ramp pressure stripping in Milky Way-like environments, hardly at all. 
But then as you kind of cross this threshold, right, about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 in stellar mass, you see this noticeable uptick where the quenching efficiency becomes, or quen gas stripping becomes an appreciable effect, something that you have to take into account. The other kind of striking thing is the scatter. Um, underneath 10 to the 8 in stellar mass, we basically span the range. And this scatter is driven entirely, at least in the, in the context of my pipeline, it's driven entirely by the variation in the H1 surface density profile. So at fixed stellar mass, these low mass objects show a, a wide variety of H1 surface density profiles, and that's important with regard to how well they strip. Um, so this was encouraging, the fact that we were able to kind of see this critical mass in our analysis. But we wanted to also test this as, a, as Basically, we wanted to vary the host properties and see how robust our, this analysis was to a variety of host properties. And so what I'm showing here are six different panels. The panels I just showed you previously, the scatter plot is this one up here. But we basically have, going from top to bottom, we increase host halo density. So the bottom panel is 10 to the minus 4 uh, particles per centimeter cubed. Top is 10 to the minus 3.5. And then moving left to right, we have uh, three different velocities. So the, this left panel, or these left, this left column corresponds to something like pericenter, or, or excuse me, this corresponds to something like first infall, and this is something similar to crossing 0.5 arvir, and then the far right is something like pericenter. And so what's nice is that we are, this analysis or this stripping pipeline basically shows that this critical mass, this scale, this satellite stellar mass scale at which stripping turns on seems to be robust to all the different properties of the host halo. So that's a nice result. That being said, the amount of H1 that we're actually removing from the gas depends very, very strongly on the host properties. So if you adopt something like this, 10 to the minus 4, point, 10 to the minus 4 and 200 kilometers per second velocity, you get relatively, I mean, you're not really doing a whole lot. You're only removing about 10% of the gas. And up here on the top right, you have something that's more like pericenter passage, and you're getting much higher gas removal, but you're still only removing roughly 40% of the gas. And these low mass satellites are so gas rich when they start out that you need to basically remove all of it. And so, so to include a slightly more realistic, I, mean, I think that's the wrong word, but we took this a step further, and we included an additional effect, which was we included turbulent viscous stripping through Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities in an analytic sense. And so what, that's what I've plotted here. And so if you, if you go back and forth, you can see that there is a, mark, a noticeable in, uptick in the amount of gas that's removed. And we're still able to reproduce this kind of critical scale uh, below which satellites become susceptible to uh, gas removal. But even with this additional giga year of turbulent viscous stripping, even in the most aggressive sense up here in the top right, we're still only removing on average roughly 60% of the H1 in these objects. So basically, these results are encouraging in that the ram pressure kind of turbulent viscous stripping mechanism seems to be turning on at the right mass scale. Our implementation is still not getting the job done because we're just not removing enough H1 from these objects. But that being said, I think there's some really important caveats that are worth discussing in the context of my very analytic <laughs> prescription. I mean, the first and foremost, we have no stellar feedback. And stellar feedback particularly in these low mass systems, is thought to be very important as they cross the virial radius. Um, there's some simulations that show this at higher masses, and the simulations that are probably going to address this are coming out, should be coming out soon, but you can see compression of, of the ISM along the leading edge, and that can induce additional star formation. There's also evidence, there's been a couple papers recently that have shown that pre-processing might actually be an important effect. Um, such that if you have dwarf-dwarf interactions right at or before infall, that can act to puff up the ISM. Because in order to make stripping more efficient, we need to basically do one of two things. We need to either make the ISM more efficient, which is kind of what these first two points would address, or we can start playing with the density of the Milky Way CGM. And that is, uh, that is relatively uncertain, and we explore this a little bit in our model, and I have some figures that I can show people if, uh, if you're interested. But we have to, generally speaking, we have to adopt very, very dense CGMs to, in order to reproduce the amount, or reproduce the quench fractions that we observe locally. Because we basically need to remove greater than 90% of the H1 from these objects on average. So I guess I'll just stop here, leave them, uh, end with my summary slide. But uh, I think this work, what's nice about this work is that we're able to reproduce this kind of critical stellar mass scale in which 
satellite quenching turns on. That being said, we're clearly not doing this in its full glory, and uh, I think in the future, and things that are coming out soon, like Latte and Elvis on Fire, will hopefully address this in a much more consistent uh, fashion. Thank you. So this is, uh, this is really nice work. I mean, so when Colin Slater and I went through this a few years ago, yeah. we agreed with you that uh, the, the quenching has to be startlingly efficient for yes. the low mass galaxies. Just right. everything has to die. And it has to die on one orbit, yes. right? Because there's only, I mean, everything being dead means you, you got paracenter and then you're dead. Um, what, you know, I, I wanted to, and, and we concur with you that <laughs> it was impossible to just strip the gas with the ram pressure if, if that's all that happened. Right. And we kind of concluded that there must be stellar feedback at some level, which you've alluded to. But I mean, yep. Lucio Meyer said, look, stellar feedback's super crucial for just throwing the gas out to where it's low density. And we know that these systems have lots of stellar feedback. That's their special right. power. That's why they're low mass. Right. Um, and then also tidal stripping. Right, that, that they're tidally extended, so they're tidally extended, and the stellar feedback makes it go out. So this, to us, made it feel like a much easier problem, but then it's really hard to model. Have you had thoughts on how to incorporate either of these without just going full up hydro? Uh, honestly, I haven't given that a lot of thought. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of implement a straightforward gas stripping pipeline, knowing that, for example, Andrew Wetzel has two latte runs that are done that I think basically address this explicitly in a self-consistent way where, um, I mean, so given what was coming down the pipeline as far as doing this properly, quote unquote, I, I, didn't, I didn't expand on this anything beyond just can we strip these things with the kind of the first order simple uh, suggestions. Thanks. Okay, that is another last question, pretty quick. The previous talks implied that the distance makes a difference in terms of the density that the things are being plowed through, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in the two objects that appeared so quenched, um, how close are they to the, set, to the host galaxies, for example? And I would you think that the, the scatter few? depends upon, the scatter would depend upon exactly where you've gone through. And I didn't see that parameter in your analysis. No, it, and it's not. Um, so our, we, we adopt average... Uh, host properties and assign, basically we choose an, an, an average ram pressure force, so we adopt a halo density and a velocity and just send, basically apply that to all of our satellites. And we vary that parameter slightly so the velocities might correspond to something that's consistent with pericenter crossage or crossing 0.5 RV. -er. But um, what makes those objects so quenched is that their H1 profiles are relatively extended and they have lower central surface density. So there's more susceptible. Their gravitational restoring forces are basically lower relative to the typical ram pressure. So we, we don't account for the, the variation in orbits at all. Okay. Uh, is the next speaker set up or it's okay? Okay, if you have more questions then. <clears throat> So I was wondering, when you say the gas stripping, do you need to, does the gas need to be removed outside of the virial radius, or does it have to be moved out to uh, a certain distance less than the virial radius, more? I was wondering specifically, what do you term uh, that the gas has been stripped from the halo, from these uh, galaxies? Yeah, I guess we, we do a very kind of simple thing where we, we literally just calculate the radius at which the ram pressure force exceeds the gravitational restoring force, and then we integrate the H1 density profiles outside of that radius. So again, the, the more complicated, like, is this gas truly unbound relative to the potential of the dwarf, we don't account for that in any way. This is just a very kind of zeroth order uh, ram pressure stripping implementation. Okay, let's thank Sean again.